want you to walk away with two things today. You don't even have to write this one down. The interview is about confidence. It's not necessarily about the perfect answer. And the second thing is do your homework. It becomes very obvious if you don't do your homework. And I've had plenty of interviews within the last couple years where I said, all right, tell me a little bit about the position you're applying for. And I said, I thought that's what you were going to tell me. And that's a quote. We had a conversation to yesterday. Somebody on my team interviewed someone, and they said, I didn't know this was a position I was interviewing for. I thought it was private equity. Do your homework. Ask the questions, clarifying questions, confirming questions, whatever you need to do to ensure that you know exactly what you're walking into with an interview. What we'll end up covering today, we'll talk about what interviewers want. We'll talk about the pitfall. We'll talk about behavioral based or situational based interviewing. And we'll talk about how to banish those nerves. Because a lot of what you're figuring out in an interview is if you don't have the confidence or you're nervous, it comes out pretty clearly in the interview. And if you're not able to get your thoughts across clearly in that interview, you might be losing your chance at this opportunity, even though you might be the best person for this job. So let's talk a little bit about what interviewers want. What do they want? Well, they want somebody that's qualified. Okay. They will obviously want someone who has the skills necessary to do this. They want to learn about you during that time. And this is about you. I like to call this program, it's not bragging if it's a fact. We'll talk about that in the pitfalls, but one of the biggest pitfalls of all is our inability to talk about ourselves. We shouldn't walk up and down the street saying, hey, look at me. That's reality TV. It's on every channel out there. But this is about who you are taking it from your resume and remember, making that story come alive and taking it from a resume and putting it into the end. So you have to be able to connect those dots and really make this about you and feel comfortable enough talking about you. I interviewed for a management development program. There were 15 slots. I went through seven or eight interviews to get here, including senior management. Guess what number I was? 16. They sat me down, they gave me the feedback. They said, Tom, you're not gonna get this position. They wanted to hear a little bit more about you. And I said, but I was a top performer. I was given special projects. And I did this, this, and this. It's on my resume. He said it didn't come out in the interviews. You can't allow that resume to be your sole tool. It has to come from you. And you have to be willing to do that and listen to it and bring what's on paper and bring it alive. I've had people hand me binders. And within those binders are certificates of recognition. Their statistics, their performance appraisals from the last many years. And I'd sit there and say, as an interviewer, what do you want me to do with this? And I'm not intentionally being sarcastic. I shouldn't have to go through that work as an interviewer. Yes, I have to do my homework as an interviewer. I need to look at your resume. I need to ask you the right <coughs> questions. I need to ensure that I have the best candidate here for the job. But I shouldn't have to be forced to go through your binder to figure out what you're all about. That's your job, is to tell me what you're all about. That's where you have to get your comfort level to say, I'm okay talking about myself. One of the hardest questions out there to answer. You ready? What's your greatest accomplishment? If you were to ask, right now, if you have paper and pen, write down your greatest accomplishment. 
five words or less. Your greatest accomplishment. Now next week, if someone was to ask you what your greatest accomplishment is, does it have to be that same one? Is there a right or a wrong answer to this thing? No. Get comfortable enough to be flexible with your answer. I think sometimes we beat ourselves up over that perfect answer. What is my greatest accomplishment? My greatest accomplishment this afternoon in my head was different from the one this morning. That's not a bad thing. And your value you're placing on that accomplishment is different than the value anyone else would place on it. Good. Make sure that that accomplishment has meaning to you and you can passionately talk about it on how it meets your standards and why it is your greatest accomplishment. Your ability to think quickly on your feet. I've had interviews over the last couple days. Yesterday's interview, this woman said, I haven't interviewed in 15 years. I'm sorry my answers are a little slow. I'm sorry I'm not answering the way you think it should be answered. I'm just sorry. Another lesson. Don't ever apologize in an interview. Because you're not going to be late. So don't apologize for that. Don't apologize because you are going in with this credibility that's up here. I have a resume, you are worth the interview. Your credibility starts here. And each time you do these little things, you're taking away from your credibility. You're knocking down your own credibility by saying, I'm sorry. Or you're knocking down your credibility by saying, I don't know the answer, or I'm not sure, or I'm not thinking quickly enough for you. Those are the things that are going to slow you down within the interview. When it comes to communication, it's a two-way dialogue. If you're waiting for me as the interviewer to ask a question, you answer it, and then you sit tight waiting for the next question, you're too much in a traditional interview approach. This isn't question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. This is a dialogue. Make it one. And even if it feels question, answer, make it a dialogue. Be engaged in the conversation, not the interview. This is a conversation that's going on. So if someone brings something up that's intriguing, ask them about it or be curious. The question should, the response shouldn't be, here's my answer. How do you think I did? <laughs> which, by the way, is a quote. But it should be, that was an interesting question. What are your thoughts on that? Or can we take it a little bit to a, in a different direction? I understand you were talking about where you, wanted, where you thought I wanted this business to be a year from now. Where do you see this business two or three years from now? Maybe the business model is changing. Is that an accurate statement? So now all of a sudden it becomes this two-way dialogue, and you're engaging in the conversation. This actually comes into play a little bit later on in the interview when we talk about Q&A. Because now if you have a set of questions, and if you're doing your homework, you have a set of questions, not a forced set of questions, but a, a set of questions that you're curious about and you really want to know the answer, maybe there's some times within the interview itself you can bring that question up. And so now you're making, you're intertwining it throughout the entire interview. So at the end of the interview, it doesn't become a checklist of five questions I felt obligated to ask. Because as an interviewer, I don't want a checklist of questions. I want you engaged in the conversation. When it comes to the interviewer, we want answers that are related to the skills necessary for the job. So go through and comb through what you think the job is all about and make sure that your words that you're choosing reflect some of the things that are out there, whether it's sales or persuasion skills or analytics. You're using that type of terminology within your interview. But I am also looking for, remember in the resumes we were talking about hard skills and soft skills. So the soft skills were, I'm a people person, I can communicate well, I'm a decent leader. The hard skills are, I'm analytical, um, I have credit background, I have collections background, I have you know, specific things to the job at hand, the technical acumen that's attached to the job. 
But here's your chance to merge the two together. But the other things, I'm going to throw a little bit of the soft skills in here because now you don't have to come out and say, on your resume, I'm a good leader, I'm a good communicator. But what we're looking for is give me examples where you have been a good leader and a good communicator. Your answers need to reflect not only the terminology of the job that's out there, but should reflect some examples that support this stuff. And one of the key ones is your ability to think independently. Give me some examples where you had to think outside the box, where you had to think independently, where you have to be creative in your thought process. So you're not governed by the policy. Or you're not governed because my manager said I have to do this. So I would start jotting down some ideas on paper that you can start saying, where have I thought in this? Because now you're starting to think in terms of behavioral-based or situational-based interview. It doesn't mean find every situation that's out there and put an answer to it. Because what an interviewer doesn't want is for you to memorize the answers. But what we do want you to do is think quickly on your feet, have some examples that are in your back pocket that you can pull out and answer confidently. So let's go back to the two things I want you to walk away with. One, be confident. Two, do your homework. Two pieces of homework. If you flip all the way to the back of the package, there are two tools that are in there. One is a long-term vision, and one is what is called a SWOT analysis. The SWOT analysis says, I'm going to do my due diligence and figure out if I'm the right fit for this job, and then I'm going to figure out what I can do to add value to this job. So SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So the strengths should be, here are the things that I like about the job, I like about the people, I like about the processes, I like about the systems I'd be using, here are the, my strengths that I think fit well within this position, and now you're starting to understand yourself better than anyone else that's out there on how you're going to fit your little piece of the puzzle to this whole picture. The weaknesses says, what are some of the things that are broken here? What are the things that I would need to work on? Maybe there are disclosures out there that are just outrageous and take 17 minutes to read and I don't feel like doing that anymore. Maybe there might be an opportunity to slim those down a little. These are weaknesses within the line of business you're interested in or the role that's out there or maybe there's some disconnects in the business there are some things that you can go in and if you had your conversations with some people that are already doing the job you can say what are the things that bother you about the job what are some things that you wish you could fix if you could and now all of a sudden you're getting a list of some things that say maybe there are some opportunities here because not every role is perfect the opportunity said, what are some things that I can do to come in and fix? So maybe you have a short-term and a long-term list of saying, here are some opportunities. Not everything can be fixed. But the opportunity say, hey, maybe I can come in and offer my opinion here or offer a different slant here. The threats say, what are some things that are out there that are going to influence this thing long-term? And I'll give you an example. I was approached for a position for an up and coming, we are ballooning with staff. We're bringing a bunch of people in very quickly for, because the economic environment a few years ago created this, we need people here. So I said, well, I'm interested, let me hear more about it. But as I did my SWOT analysis, the threat I kept landing on was, a couple years from now, the economic piece is gonna settle itself down, it's gonna stabilize, and guess what? They're going to reduce that staff just as quickly as they hired it. I'm not sure I want to be a piece of that business here. That was my final decision that I went through my application. This will help you to determine if it's the right job for you and you have the skill set to do this. And set your goals high. You'd be shocked how much you can apply to this. So this SWAT starts to say, okay, I'm a good fit. I see some opportunities. I can come in now with some great ideas in an interview. Because I already done my homework. I know where some of the opportunities are. I know I can offer some opinions on what I think can be fixed. Are you required to do this? No. But remember when we talked about with resumes, as you would in the interview, 
This is one way to differentiate yourself from someone else. So you take a SWOT analysis, and the, one of the questions you typically get in an interview is, what are you going to do on day one? Introduce myself to all the people I'm working with. What else do you want? It's a benign question. That's not going to lead any interviewer to make any type of decision for you. But imagine your answer coming out and say, well, this is what I would do on day one. But in reality, I think what you're trying to get from me is what is my strategy and vision to do on, in day 30, day 60, and day 90? I'm going to take this out three months for you, and here's my long-term vision. I've taken it from a tactical, here's what you're going to do on day one, to a strategy that says, Here, here's what I can do to influence your business and make it better. Here, I am adding value. Think of how powerful that comes from.